Okay, we will start this uh, summer course. Uh, good afternoon to participants from, from East Asia and surrounding countries. Uh, good morning to participants from the Middle East and Europe. And good morning, uh, good night uh, to participants from USA. Nice to meet uh, all of you. Uh, uh, and in the second days of the virtual summer course uh, in tropical aquaculture and fisheries uh, management. I am Ekostio Budi, will be your moderator in this session. Uh, first, I, uh, first, I would like to thank to Dr. Bartolomeo Gorgorion, uh, Dr. Risa Julinatno Setiawan, and also Dr. Tilsi Rohman for the willingness to be the invited speaker in this uh, summer course. Uh, in this session, uh, the invited speaker will deliver uh, the issue related to environmental change impacting the ecosystem from many point of view. Uh, and in the first presentation, Dr. Bartolomeo will deliver the topic of the emerging uh, mixes one, or asset to one uh, freshwater, especially on freshwater fish, especially on uh, salmonid. Uh, before we are going to the presentation, uh, let me share the CV of uh, Dr. Bartolomeo, please the committee uh, to share the CV from Dr. Bart. Uh, Dr. Bart uh, become- uh, you want, I can briefly introduce myself. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, you thank you. Okay, okay. Okay, so- oh, okay, you did it, thanks. Uh, the committee already prepared for you. Uh, Dr. Bar Bartolomeo, uh, or Bitcoin called Dr. Bart, uh, get a veterinarian in in Italy and then got a master in aquatic uh, veterinary studies in Stirling University and then continue by a PhD program in the Aberdeen University and now uh, Dr. Bart uh, uh, are the PIC in the uh, fish pathology and immunology laboratory in the Michigan State uh, University and then we, uh, we will go into the main presentation uh, Dr. Bart uh, you have uh, 30 minutes for your presentation and uh, time is yours uh, from now. Okay. Thank you very much for the um, introduction. And yeah, I will go through this uh, presentation, which um, today I think is going to be a little bit uh, different um, on based on the, the topic that you're discussing during the, the course. It's not really about uh, tropical um, aquaculture or fisheries, but it's about it's about some, um, a topic that is becoming um, always more important uh, um, in the northern hemisphere, above all um, across Europe and North America, uh, due to uh, to global warming, uh, so linked to climate change uh, phenomenon. Um, my lecture today in, uh, will be about the impact of uh, tetracapsuloides uh, briosalmonin and the, the effect of proliferative kidney disease on uh, salmonin fish. Um, but um, I don't know how many of you are already familiar with the mixozoan uh, parasite. Their name uh, came from mixo, which means uh, slime and zoa animal. Um, they are um, microscopic uh, uh, spore forming endoparasite and they are um, very well adapted to um, I mean, to be um, to be a parasite uh, pay attention um, to um, um, refer to new uh, literature because uh, mixozoan um, are metazoan they are not protozoan um, because they have uh, different types of uh, uh, cells. Um, they, they also have a cell, cell, cell junction, as we can see in um, this uh, schematic uh, um, illustration. And the very, they have a very typical polar capsules. Um, uh, it's a traditional name uh, used until when people realize they are um, homologous. Uh, to the stinging cells uh, that have uh, nidaria, so uh, like in uh, jellyfish. So in this way, using the polar capsule, they can extrude with, uh, with a very uh, strong pressure and um, speed, 
um, the polar filament, um, which is a um, coiled filament of uh, infectious uh, DNA um, that actually they can use to um, infect the, um, their host. Um, let me uh, briefly um, introduce you the um, uh, two host life cycle of um, Mixozoana, which was discovered in uh, 1984 um, um, for uh, one of the best known Mixozoana parasite, which is a Mixobolus uh, cerebralis. Um, so um, basically, they cycle between a vertebrate and a vertebrate host. Um, the vertebrate release a mixospore uh, stage, while the invertebrate release a actinospore stage. So based on the uh, um, um, characteristic of their true host life cycle, and above all, based on um, what is the um, invertebrate um, host, um, they can be divided in a mixosporea, uh, so they cycle between um, anelids um, and um, fish. Um, and there are many species in this uh, um, class, uh, thousands of uh, species. And then there is the, a class with um, less species. Uh, currently, there are uh, less than 20 species um, identified. Um, and uh, the Malacosporea, um, which uh, cycle between uh, bryozoan and um, fish. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar uh, with the bryozoan, but during this presentation, I will um, explain you a little bit more also about um, this kind of invertebrate. Um, currently, there are uh, over um, 50 uh, life cycles um, of mixozoan parasites that have been already fully uh, described. But actually, it is really important to understand, which is also the point um, for my lecture um, today, it is very important that you understand that um, climate change is basically um, altering, is changing the um, endemic areas where mixozoan parasite can infect both vertebrate and the um, invertebrate host. And this is becoming an issue uh, for fishery and um, for aquaculture product production um, around the world. So um, today my topic will be um, about proliferative kidney disease caused by Malacosporea uh, species, but actually um, there are many other species um, uh, that can um, infect fish also in uh, tropical uh, um, areas and also um, in uh, um, uh, in a warmer uh, warmer uh, climate in um, both uh, um, oceans and freshwater uh, systems. But let's see um, which one are the, um, the what's the the type of um, infection that um, mixozoan can act um, on a fish. So normally, um, mixozoan parasites are uh, localized in the, um, in the lumen. Like, for example, we can see here in this picture, the ureter, a histological section of the ureter of uh, um, an Atlantic uh, cod. Um, this is the work I did during my master in Scotland in the uh, um, University of Stirling. Um, and actually extracting the, the parasite from the ureter um, live parasite, we could and then identify the, um, uh, the feature, uh, ultrastructural feature of, um, of the spore. Like for example, you can see here very nicely the polar capsule uh, with, the, um, with the polar um, filament. Um, but then when the parasite managed to, um, to pass the, um, in, the, in the parenchyma, which is the, the functional uh, um, area of, for example, the, the kidney, in this case, it may cause a pathology. And this may be a very variable according to the um, host uh, response and several other um, uh, condition that may facilitate the infection, such as uh, water temperature. Um, let me now briefly um, introduce which one are currently the main uh, mixozoan uh, caused um, disease. 
Um, and um, I think many of you are already familiar with the uh, whirling uh, disease, um, which is a big issue in, um, in uh, salmon in the fisheries and also um, in aquaculture. Um, then in the Mediterranean area, um, enteromic sources causes, causes by enteromic some uh, lay is mostly affecting uh, gilded um, sea bream. Um, in the um, in the Pacific uh, um, uh, Northwest, um, and enteronecrosis caused by Ceratonova shasta uh, in Salmonid, um, it's uh, pretty important. And actually, this is a picture that I took last week uh, with Dr. Ferguson uh, during a sampling of uh, Sokai salmon in uh, in Alaska. Um, proliferative gill disease, um, it affects um, a, a warm um, water uh, species, uh, which is um, channel catfish, and this is most important uh, in the southern uh, part of the US. Um, then we go other uh, parasites like uh, um, uh, Kudoa or, or Negaya um, um, that may cause a soft flesh syndrome. So you can easily understand that um, fish in this kind of condition are uh, very difficult to, um, to sell. So um, those diseases may cause uh, a big uh, issue, economical issue for uh, fishery or for aquaculture because of the uh, deterioration of the, uh, the product. And then uh, possibly one of the most important um, mixozoana caused uh, disease is uh, definitely proliferative kidney disease caused by tetracapsuloides biosalmone, uh, which is a disease affecting um, mostly um, salmonid um, fish species. So PKD, um, is currently considered uh, um, an emerging um, disease, um, uh, being quite, quite important for uh, wild population as well as uh, for uh, um, aquaculture. Um, it is um, so the parasite is exotic in uh, both North America and uh, Europe, and for Europe, I mean um, from countries going uh, as southern as uh, um, northern Italy uh, or uh, Spain up to um, uh, Scandinavian countries, um, even in Denmark, Norway, but also um, in, uh, in the UK, uh, even in, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, and then even in Iceland, as I will see. So it, it's quite widespread. Um, in, uh, um, and in, uh, in several countries, uh, PKD has been uh, responsible for uh, the decline of specific native species, such as um, brown trout uh, in uh, Switzerland um, that have been declining in the last 10-15 uh, years due to um, an increasing um, water uh, temperature in some river, which has caused um, an uh, um, increasing um, pathogenicity of, of this parasite on native brown trout, which is the native species of trout in uh, Europe, um, but also in the Arctic char in Iceland. Um, and the, the fact that PKD arrived in uh, Iceland, it is, it is very interesting, very uh, peculiar, uh, because actually, um, as you know, Iceland is an island in the middle of the Atlantic and uh, open to many questions how this uh, uh, parasite, which is not a virus, it's, a, um, it's actually um, a parasite who need a secondary um, uh, host, um, how it may be uh, arrived uh, there. So um, it is really important to understand that um, PKD pathobiology is linked to uh, water uh, temperature, and I will provide some explanation about this during this lecture. 
And the pathobiology is complicated by polymicrobial infection. As we can see in this picture, which is uh, uh, during our first detection of PKD in Austria, where uh, we were called because of a mortality outbreak, but of course the, uh, the farmer uh, was asking us about Saprolegna uh, parasitica, which is a oomycid uh, pathogen, but then we find that actually it was PKD which was caused. So year after year, we see more fish mortality outbreaks. And this may be the case of uh, North America, in which um, Terracaposuroides briosalmone is uh, exotic in the Western uh, North America um, and causing um, um, damage to um, aquaculture um, facilities. Um, the wild population are also uh, highly susceptible, but actually there are a few people uh, studying um, wild uh, salmonid uh, simply because uh, there is uh, less economic um, interest. So um, PKD has been described in uh, many states, mostly in the, um, in the uh, western coast, um, but also in Canada, and actually in Canada, it's pretty interesting because it has been described both in British Columbia, but also in Newfoundland, which is actually in the East Coast. Um, and I can tell you that we recently um, detected the parasite also in Michigan, so uh, in the Great Lakes um, area. In the last uh, few years, um, PKD caused a huge mortality outbreak. Um, to the Yellowstone River, which is one of the uh, largest um, freshwater system in the um, uh, Western um, US, um, with the, uh, huge damage also to the um, tourism uh, industry. So you can see as many sectors and then are um, interconnected each other and maybe affected by pathogens. Um, I will briefly now uh, show you the um, Terracaposoides biosalmone uh, life cycle. So basically, invertebrate hosts such as uh, Bryozoan, like uh, Fredericella sultana, uh, release infection malacospore that can infect uh, fish, in which the cellozoic uh, sporum, so the normal part of the life cycle, um, that the fish use to release infectious spore uh, to the um, uh, invertebrate is uh, um, happening. Um, <clears throat> and this part of the life cycle is faster and more efficient in the warmer waters. Um, above all, when the uh, river water goes over uh, 15 degrees Celsius. Um, then from invertebrate, um, the parasite can be uh, disposed through um, passive and uh, active um, uh, mechanism um, can be basically uh, dispersed. And this may have been the case how uh, the, um, the parasite may have also colonized a new area of the world, such as the example I did before of um, Iceland. So I'm gonna show you now um, some, um, I'm gonna tell you about uh, when uh, we find for the first time um, the parasite in uh, Austria. Um, so basically we were called by uh, this restocking uh, facility um, experiencing high uh, trout mortality um, because, because um, I mean, the, the farmer, they were worried about what was going on. So we assessed the presence of all the, the component of the tetracapsoid biosalmone life cycle in the, in the farm. Um, Indeed, we find the bryozoan, uh, we find the fish, you can see a juvenile uh, trout in this uh, uh, picture. Um, and when we start collecting uh, bryozoan, then we moved bryozoan in a laboratory um, system and we try to uh, adapt them, to farm them. Um, in order to, first of all, detect the, the presence of the parasite and then to reproduce in a fully controlled um, laboratory um, condition the entire uh, life cycle of the, um, of the, the parasite. Um, <clears throat> and it was interesting uh, because um, even the, the, the production of the uh, infectious malacospore from 
the bryozoan uh, was announced by uh, by the water uh, temperature mm, and so um, in this way we were able uh, to produce infectious malacospor from the uh, bryozoan to infect fish and then from infected fish to infect the pathogen free uh, bryozoan that we were um, very carefully um, selecting um, so we can see in this video uh, has a spore suck um, are um, enlarging and creating a spore and then are releasing those spore through the um, esophagus of the bryozoan which is expelling the spore outside and in this image we can see how the, the spore look like and um, I can tell you that they rotate even faster and they become larger even faster when you increase the water temperature uh, and in our case, uh, we did in order also to accelerate it because it's very time um, consuming to, um, to hold this full life cycle in laboratory conditions. Um, <clears throat> so during the um, Federico Sella Sultana, normally during the, um, the winter, so in, during the cold um, condition, also produce uh, statoblast, uh, which for this species are called uh, piptoblast. Um, so then they, those are some um, overwintering uh, propagulas. Uh, so then um, it happens in order to allow the species to survive uh, during the ice uh, condition, like during the, um, the winter. Um, so basically uh, during this time, there are no viable um, colonies of bryozoan that can release infectious uh, parasite in the water and it's when then um, fish um, stock management um, can be um, more efficient although uh, it's risky to put fish in the water when the, um, I mean during the during the winter so it's not always feasible um, we hatch the statoblast in a laboratory condition um, after uh, taking them from uh, from colonies and of course this process was much faster in a warmer water i can tell you um, we also reduced um, we also shortened the life cycle of several weeks when uh, increasing the water temperature up to um, even 19 20 uh, degrees so in this way we were able to obtain um, adult large uh, colonies of uh, bryozoan in a petri dish. But we also discovered that by doing this, um, the, the colony was uh, degenerating. And as you can see in, um, in this video, they start to uh, create a migra migrating uh, solid. Um, this mechanism was uh, uh, discovered by keeping them at uh, 1921 uh, degree uh, Celsius and basically um, this was a new mechanism um, uh, discovered for bryozoan in general in act of active uh, dispersal. So basically they um, um, separate from the main uh, branch they created this kind of migrating zoid that can be released for the degenerating branch and go attaching uh, someone else to any other surface. So if you think in a context of a river, you can easily imagine that this migrating zoid can uh, travel for many uh, kilometers and infect a um, new, uh, new area, even when uh, it's bringing uh, within uh, itself uh, the, um, the parasite, so the parasite can also be dispersed in a new area. But let's now see the, um, uh, the part that is most interesting from the fish point of view um, of the Tetracapsoides um, life cycle, which is uh, PKD, which is happening uh, when the uh, parasite is able to move in the interstitium of the kidney and start the histozoic extrasporogonic uh, proliferation. This is happening only in uh, um, salmonids, which are susceptible uh, to the um, infection and are um, hold in uh, suitable condition, so including suitable water temperature um, condition, because the um, pathobiology is actually faster and exacerbated in uh, warmer waters. <clears throat> um, so we can see that 
the esozoic esosporogonic proliferation happens in the target organs and the main target organs it's actually the posterior kidney of um, of a salmonid and causing a very severe chronic um, so is going to die uh, due to a nephromegaly spino um, megaly um, and and also um, it's more exposed to um, co-infection um, I think there is an issue with um, okay now it's not a message in chat um, so <clears throat> the um, uh, the incubation period for a PKD, um, as I indicated in this slide, can be between three to seven weeks. And this is uh, highly dependent on when this is uh, happening, in which season, uh, and of course, uh, where, because of course, can be much faster in a geographic location where the, uh, the water temperature is, um, is higher. Uh, the, the, the spleen and also the, the kidney, uh, actually the kidney is the main target, can become uh, huge up to uh, 10 times of the normal uh, volume due to this disease, as we can see in this uh, image. And um, um, fish population that uh, are naive to the infection can have a, a very high um, mortality. Um, after that, um, if they survive, actually, um, the, the pathology infection, they can also uh, recover if they are not fully susceptible. Um, and this can start uh, about 10 to 12, 12 weeks after the, um, the infection. So fish can become too, um, too challenged. Uh, but the PKD uh, diagnostic uh, approach can be uh, pretty uh, complex because normally fish with the PKD also have something else. Uh, so um, co-infection with other primary or um, secondary pathogens like um, uh, bacteria that are normally in the same um, aquaculture uh, in environment um, and some of them may be pretty, uh, pretty common. Um, and the main differential diagnostic should be done uh, with the bacterial um, kidney uh, disease, which is instead caused by uh, Renibacterium salmoninarum and is uh, um, causing a typical uh, granulomatose um, lesion in the, the kidney, uh, similar as uh, uh, mycobacteriosis, uh, which is really important because, as you know, it's a, a zoonosis. Um, and also um, other similar condition like uh, Pisiricaceae uh, salmonid, which instead happen in uh, seawater uh, farm and fish. Um, the, the immune response during uh, PKD is pretty um, peculiar because actually this pathogen is highly immunosuppressant, so it's able to um, induce um, <clears throat> um, immunosuppression in the in the fish, mostly mediated through IL-10 um, and the SOX genes, as you can see during this uh, um, 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 study, which I did during my uh, PhD. Um, so the fish can be prone to um, other uh, um, infection and suffer the, um, the disease. Uh, but according to the water um, temperature, um, the host can act different types of um, immune response to fight the infection. So we can see that at the lower temperature, like 12 degrees Celsius, uh, the fish can act a kind of a, a tolerance strategy. So mostly uh, through a Th1 like Dr. response. Bad? Yes. Dr. Bad? You have yes. five minutes remaining. Okay, I'm trying to presentation. Okay. Yeah, I'm five going. Minute. Okay. Okay. okay, perfect. Um, so why instead at uh, 15 de uh, degree, um, fish can act instead a resistant uh, strategy. So mostly but through the production of uh, um, antibodies or uh, trying to fight the uh, pathogen in, in another way. Um, so um, to go quickly um, through, through the end, um, 
we can see that when PKD is reproduced in the lab, so actually with a higher water temperature up to uh, 20, 22 degrees, the mortality becomes basically 100% um, within uh, basically two, three months after uh, infection because the pathology was really exacerbated. And this happened also when there were no other um, um, infection. Um, yeah, um, another infection, and also we can see that um, several organs of the, the fish, um, so also including the liver, the spleen, um, were found to be uh, positive. So this was because the, um, in this kind of condition, um, the, the strain of the parasite became highly uh, pathogenic. Um, then we also did some study in, uh, um, in Alaska, uh, where now during the summer, the water temperature is becoming pretty high, above all in some uh, river system, like the, in the Yukon River, and we re-examined some archived um, uh, samples, finding also uh, PKD in uh, Cham Salmon, um, and uh, this was the American northernmost case of uh, PKD. Um, in, uh, um, in the English Bay uh, Lake, um, which during the summer reach a temperature also above the uh, 15 degrees Celsius, um, there was uh, this kind of situation of um, complex uh, pathology um, by occurrence of uh, formicolosis. Um, and actually people also abandoned the aquaculture uh, facility because of the mortality uh, caused by um, the presence of this parasite. Um, I'm gonna, I don't think we got enough time to go through this uh, slide, but in here uh, it is illustrated the PKD management solution, uh, but yeah. <clears throat> so, in, uh, to summarize, PKD is an emerging sneaky treat for uh, salmonid uh, with the endemic uh, distribution moving forward, announced by the global warming, uh, which announced the um, reproducibility of the uh, life cycle. Because the water temperature can modulate parasite intensity, pathogenicity, and also modulate the immune response of the um, host. Um, and mostly affecting uh, rainbow trout. Um, but PKD play a, a key role in the co-infection uh, patterns. <clears throat> and we can see here that the fish with PKD normally are found with many other uh, pathogens, both um, bacteria, but also um, um, oh seed, uh, other parasites, uh, some of parasites I guess you are already familiar um, with. Um, so the role of PKD is uh, really important during, um, uh, during co-infection um, and above all in uh, aquaculture um, uh, contest where it can also um, <clears throat> require more antibiotic treatment and um, vanify vaccination uh, strategies. Um, so um, remember the, the importance of uh, co-infection um, in fish, which can result in antagonistic or synergistic um, interaction, and they are facilitated by the environment in which the fish uh, lives. Uh, this has been also part of my uh, studies, uh, and I'm focusing in, uh, through different uh, initiatives, like uh, a special session during, during uh, conference or um, special issue in journal, and actually uh, we'll also have some during the upcoming conference in Santiago in Chile, because there are many open questions still to ask. I would like to thank for your um, attention. And if there is any, uh, any question, I don't know if we have enough time to take any, any question. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bart. I think it's a very nice uh, presentation and will generate a rich discussion later, but we must uh, finish uh, two presenters first, then we will close with a question and answer in the, the end of the session. 
Oke, okay, let's move to the second presenter, Dr. Risa Zuli Ratno Setiawan. Iya, yeah, uh, Dr. Dr. Bart, please. Uh, your... please. Yeah. 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 Is it up now? Yes, already. Oke, okay, yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, thank you. Oke, okay, I will introduce uh, Dr. Risa Yulirano Setiawan first. Uh, uh, Dr. Risa graduated from Bremen, uh, Jerman, and now a lecturer in our research department, Gajah Mada University. Oke. Okay. Uh, sorry, IT. Oke, okay, maybe we can uh, continue with uh, to the presentation for Dr. Riza. Dr. Riza, uh, time is yours. Thank you, Dr. Eko Sebudi. Can you see my slide now? Yes, already. Oke. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Riza Stiawan, and today I would like to share our research results to you all, and hopefully it will give us some opportunity to collaboration. So my talk today is about seasonal and interannual variability of the Indonesian seas. Uh, this is Indonesian seas, actually, as it is called the Indonesian seas, plural, because the seas comprise many regional seas. Like, you, like here, for example, Halmahera Sea, Moluka Sea, Banda Sea, Flores Sea, Java Sea, and so on. So that's why we call it as the Indonesian seas. And this is the only seas in the tropics that connected the Pacific Ocean and Indian Ocean. And the Indonesian seas have complex bathymetry. So, in the western part of the Indonesian seas is characterized by shallow bathymetry here, and, and the eastern part of the seas are characterized by complex bathymetry and deep oceans. The Indonesian seas are very important for the global thermohaline circulation. So this figure shows the simplified thermohaline circulations and one of the pathway of the circulation flowing through the Indonesian seas and we call it or the scientists call it as the Indonesian through flow. This is the, the red rows here demonstrate the road of the Indonesian through flow or the ITF. So 80% of the water mass from the North Pacific thermocline water mass flowing through the Sulawesi Sea and entering the Makassar Strait. And then this water mass uh, can exit from the Indonesian Sea through Lombok Strait, Ombai Strait, and Timor Passage. Um, the rest of the water mass enter the Indonesian Sea through the Maluku Sea or Moluka Sea and the Halmahera Sea. And the trace of this ITF can be seen in this figure. This is the salinity profile of the thermocline and the ITF is characterized by low salinity water mass. And if we look at the bigger images, as, as you can see here that the upper image is the temperature profile of the thermocline, while the bottom image shows you the salinity profile of the thermocline, Uh, we can see here that um, the input or, or the contributions of the Indonesian true flow is significant and, and it determines the, it, uh, the water mass profile in the Indian Oceans. So uh, this figure shows you the sea surface temperature in February. And one of the most noticeable or, or one, one of the most uh, 
uh, the most pronounced characteristic of the Indonesian seas are that um, the region is characterized by higher SSD equal to 28 degrees Celsius. Uh, and this is the situations of the SSD during February, and this is during August. And you can see here uh, in both uh, different seasons, the Indonesian seas are characterized by SSD of 28 degrees Celsius. And in here, in this, I'm sorry, Dr. Eko, can you see uh, the movement of my mouse? Uh, please try again. No. no. Hmm? Can you see it? No. no, no, no. Okay. Okay. How about now? Can you see it? Still the same situation. Okay. Okay, I no. Can you okay, see? I it can now? see your yes. I can see your. Okay. okay. So this this part is characterized by relatively cooler SSD compared in in February. Yes. And so the whole month in I mean in, in February um, the the seas are characterized by higher SSD. And, and in the next few slides, I would like to explain why this can happen, why this SSD is relatively lower compared to the February. So this is simply because the existence of monsoon wind, in this case, the Southeast monsoon, uh, as it is called, uh, the wind uh, during the Southeast monsoon, the winds blows from the Southeast to the uh, I mean, blows from the Australian continent to the Austra to the Asian continents, and this image is the wind stress. Uh, this image shows you the wind stress in May, and red colors indicate the stronger winds, while in while blue colors denote uh, uh, lower wind stress. Or, or if you are not familiar with wind stress, you can just imagine this is a wind speed. Wind stress is actually the stress of the wind to the sea surface. And this is May and, and then June. Uh, there is an enhancement of the wind stress or speed in the region. And in, this is condition of wind stress in July, August. August actually is the peak of the Southeast monsoon wind. So we will close, we will look this closely in a few slides and in September, the wind speed or the, the magnitude of the wind stress uh, decreases, yeah? And so you can see here, only this region in the internal Indian Sea are characterized by stronger wind stress, but in here, um, I mean, in general, the only few spots in the Indian Sea are characterized by wind, spot, uh, wind stress. So the following figures are, are the SSD images from June uh, to September or during Southeast Monsoon. You can see here, uh, there is a significant sea surface cooling due to the wind stress. I mean, this is actually the response of the wind stress on the sea surface temperature, and it is consistent actually. So this is August, like I said before, August is the peak of the, uh, the peak of the wind speed or wind stress. And we can see here uh, the SSD responded quite well. So the minimum SSD cooling also occurs in August. And then um, there is some spots that experiences significant cooling. For instance, in here, in the southern coast of Java and the Badasi and the Arafura Sea. And uh, in September, the cooling, the magnitude of cooling decreases due to the wind speed decreases. So in here, the SSC start to a little bit warmer. And yeah, as I mentioned before, and, um, the SSD responded quite well with the, uh, I mean, to the wind stress and uh, this, Another striking effect of the of the wind of uh, another striking effect due to monsoon wind is the 
is the appearance of higher chlorophyll A or higher phytoplankton in the region during southeast monsoon. For instance, here, uh, uh, we can see here there is an enhancement of sea surface productivity in the uh, or of the southern coast of Java. So you can see here the red colors mean higher chlorophyll A, the blue colors denote the lower chlorophyll A or the low chlorophyll A. So this is actually the result of, of upwelling. And uh, the evidence of upwelling is also can be seen in this slide. So this is, we analyze this figure uh, from this region, I mean, from this region, the upwelling of the, so upwelling of the southern coast of Java, and this is the water mass profile. This is actually the profile of density, and the x y uh, the x axis here demonstrate the months, and y axis here demonstrate demonstrate the depth. So zero means sea surface, and you can see here that um, uh, water mass. The red colors indicate higher higher density of water mass. So higher density of water mass uplifted uh, to the shallow uh, water depth due to simply, uh, uh, this is simply due to the effect of uh, wind stress through Ekman upwelling. Well, when the wind, uh, I mean, uh, when, when the wind is not strong enough to, to cause upwelling, then the water, mass with higher density will not be uplifted to the shallower depth. Go back to here, go back to this wind stress images. And this is the situation of the wind stress from December to February, meaning that um, the what I would like to emphasize here is that the direction of the wind is, is changing. Um, the in this uh, in this winter monsoon, or we call it northwest monsoon, the winds blows from the other direction. The winds blows from the Asian continent to the Australian continent, and similarly, like the southeast monsoon, there is a peak of the wind speed or wind stress. And during the northwest monsoon, the peak occurs in January. So this is the February. And then similarly, uh, the response of the sea surface temperature can be seen or, or obvious also. So this is SST in December, and this is January, and this is February. So we, we can see here there is a good agreement between the strong wind and the SST cooling, as well as the chlorophyll A. And the northwest monsoon is associated with the rainy seasons because the winds carry moist air, warm and moist air from, from the Asian continents. And uh, because of the rainy seasons, there are many terrigenous inputs due to rain yeah, or continental runoff. And this continental runoff causes uh, the salinity to decrease. So the green color here means low salinity, whereas the red color here means uh, higher salinity. So uh, you can see here that the Java Sea or, or in the southern coast of Kalimantan and the eastern coast of Sumatra, the salinity is low, is simply due to the runoff, due to rainfall. And, and yeah, and this is salinity during uh, northwest monsoon. For for the productivity, uh, in general, the Indonesian Sea experiences the the Indonesian Sea is experience oligotrophic, oligotrophic conditions. So as a bench as a benchmark, that I mean the benchmark here is is the upwelling of the southern coast of Java. Here we cannot see any. Uh, higher chlorophyll A, or we cannot see phytoplankton bloom during the season because it is simply that the wind is not favorable for upwelling. But we can see here higher 
higher uh, chlorophyll A. This is actually not chlorophyll A. This is actually the evidence or, or the results of uh, continental runoff due to higher rainfall. And this is, we call it CDOM or color dissolved organic matter. So we must be very careful to analyze this kind of data because uh, in this area, in the eastern part of the Sumatra and the southern coast of Kalimantan, it is a mixed signal between phytoplankton bloom and, and CDOM, color dissolved organic matter. Um, during transition motion, uh, during transition motion, that is April, the wind stress is basically during transition motion, the condition of the Indonesian Sea is quite boring. Nothing happened here. The wind speed is low and then the SSC is high. Why is that? Because, um, yeah, because no wind, so solar insulation uh, maximum, I mean, the the water can receive uh, many uh, solar radiations and then the sea surface warm up similarly or likewise during the transition monsoon in november the wind stress or the wind speed is is uh, we can say or i can say there is no wind here because it's so weak and then similar condition can be observed here it causes the rise of the sst that's from the seasonal perspective. Now I would like to talk about the interannual inter variability of, of the Indonesian seas. Due to its complex or unique positions in the tropics, so the seas here, the Indonesian seas here, is, is strongly influenced or is strongly modulated by interannual climate variability that is IOD, Indian Ocean Dipole, and ENSO. So the gray arrows here represent the Walker circulations in the tropics. Yeah. So uh, if you are not familiar with the circulation, and the Pacific Walker circulation occurs in the equatorial Pacific Oceans. And actually there are, there are, uh, there are several Walker circulations. The first one is the, the biggest one in the Pacific and then Indian Oceans and also in the Atlantic Oceans. And this climate variability uh, strongly influenced the sea surface or ocean condition of the Indian Seas. To inform you that, that we, I would like to first focus on the IOD or Indian Ocean Dipole. When IOD, when negative IOD takes place, Indonesia region or maritime continent or maritime continent will experience uh, extreme rainfall. And in on the other hand, when positive IOD happens, the Indonesian seas or the maritime continent will experience uh, drought conditions. But uh, although we experience uh, drought condition, we during the positive IOD, the Indonesian seas experiencing strong upwelling, meaning the many or, or there are massive nutrients in the oceans, although the lens is dry. So the second climate variability is ENSO. You, uh, I, I believe you already uh, know about this or you already familiar about, about ENSO. And so similar to IOD, it is a uh, couple atmosphere ocean interaction in the equatorial Pacific oceans. So, and so has two phases, El Nino and La Nina. El Nino is associated with drought season in the maritime continent, whereas La Nina is associated with extreme rainfall in the maritime continent. And again, Due to its complexity, um, we 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 analyze uh, in in great detail, and I would like to show you the results. We 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 didn't analyze the whole agencies, but we we choose to analyze um, uh, the effect of ENSO and IOD to several uh, region uh, to several uh, regional seas, and. Before showing that results, I would like to 
introduce to about, introduce you about the index of ENSO and IOD. Uh, the index of IOD, or it is called the DMI dipole mode index, is basically the SSD anomaly between eastern part on the tropical Indian Ocean, in tropical Indian Ocean, and and the western part of Indian Ocean. Whereas um, in the uh, whereas for the ENSO ENSO index. There are many indices in for the ENSOs, but usually we use the Nino point Nino three point four index because, um, yeah, because we just prefer the the center in the center of the tropical uh, Pacific oceans, and we and the scientists call the index uh, as ONI index. So this is the index actually that I plot from. 2007 and to, from 2007 2019 and um, if the 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 dark uh, the black curve represents the on index and the the red curves represents the DMI index so when those indices when both indices shows I mean when when on the index value positive means there is a El Nino event. So when the only index shows negative value or indicates negative value means La Nina happens. So for the DMI index, when the uh, value positive means IOD positive or positive IOD takes place. Whereas when the DMI index shows negative values means um, uh, negative IOD happens or operates so we selected this region because this region is quite interesting we so the the first um this image is wind speed uh, sorry wind stress and this is actually bali island lombok island and nusa tenggara island chains and this is southern makassar street this is sulawesi peninsula Brown colors means higher topography, so red colors means higher wind stress. This is SSD, so you can see here SS, SSD responded quite well. There is a strong cooling in this region in August, and also we, we can see here there is a strong um, or robust chlorophyll A bloom or phytoplankton bloom uh, at the same place and at the same time. We correlate this. Uh, parameters to ENSO and IOD. So the upper figure here are the correlation results of ENSO with wind, SSD, and chlorophyll A. The red colors indicate positive correlations. The blue color denotes um, negative correlations. So meaning that when during ENSO or, or when ENSO happen, uh, this regions, I mean, this regions has positive correlation with ENSO, the wind, I mean, and then the SSD surface temperature has negative correlation with ENSO, and the chlorophyll A um, has positive correlation with the ENSO. We can so uh, similar observation also can be seen in the IOD correlations um, when ENSO. Um, the red line is no, no. I mean, what I would like to highlight here is that when ENSO and the IOD happens, this region is uh, uh, showing strong influence or strong strong response to ENSO and IOD. When ENSO happens, the chlorophyll A bloom is is enhanced. Uh, similarly, when the IOD happens, the chlorophyll A bloom also enhance. Similar trend also can be observed in the SSD. Okay, I hope you 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 understand what I'm explaining. Um, and we perform similar analysis. This is basically a simple correlation, simple Pearson correlations. Um, we perform similar analysis to different regions, but we we got different results here. Um, again, this is 
di Indian Oceans and this is Bali, Lombok and Nusa Tenggara Sunda, Nusa Tenggara Island Chain and the left graph here is the wind this is SST and chlorophyll A. Um, the 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 upper panel images are the result of correlation between ENSO to wind between ENSO and wind and SST and chlorophyll A. We found here that chlorophyll A, there, there is a chlorophyll A bloom during ENSO event. But until today, uh, but interestingly, um, the wind shows negative correlations and the SSD is still showing a negative correlation. In this previous, in the previous region, uh, we can see a good agreement here. When you have strong winds, you will get cooler SST and higher chlorophyll A or, or phytoplankton bloom. But in here, we have a low wind speed or low wind stress, but we have uh, here negative, strong, strong cooling and strong uh, upwelling. Uh, the same result also also uh, shown by the correlation between these three parameters with the IOD or with DMI dipole mode index. Um, the the chlorophyll the strong chlorophyll bloom we um, occur in August and and also the strong SST cooling occur in August, but um, interestingly, the wind stress showing uh, negative values, meaning that the causes of this bloom and this cooling is not the wind forcing. We until today we we do not know what is the main cause for this bloom and and for this cooling. So, a uh, take home message from from uh, my talk is that. Um, I myself, uh, thanks to the satellite observation, because the existence of the satellite observation uh, truly um, give me insights about the seasonal variability of the sea surface of the emission seas. And, and however, until today, we, we Indonesia do not have um, time series, long time series of the um, of the deeper oceans. So until today, actually Indonesia doesn't know what happened in, in their backyard. So they, they, are, they do not know what's going on in the deeper oceans. And that's why we, Indonesia needs a vigorous or, or many in-situ observations. And one of, Yes, one of the solutions is actually um, Argo float. Argo float is, is instruments that can be deployed in the oceans. And this figure shows you the results of the global agro Argo float measurements from 2006 year to 2020, 21. And this is actually temperature anomaly from sea surface to to the depth of 1800 meters, sorry. And you can see here, there is a trend of um, ocean warming here. The red colors here denote the positive anomaly, meaning the warming, the warming of the oceans, whereas the blue color here, negative, negative temperature anomaly, meaning that the um, oceans, the water column, experiencing uh, cooling. From 2014, I think from roughly from 2014 or 16, the entire oceans experiencing significant warming. But what, 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 but what I believe is that this, uh, uh, this calculations did not include the data from the Indonesian seas. So this is actually the distribution of the Argo float in 2007. To my knowledge, the Argo float program was launched in 2004. And then in 2007, there were nearly 3,000 floats, Argo floats in the entire oceans. But again, you can see here 
there is no Argo floats in the internal Indian Oceans. Yeah, you can see here maybe one, two, three, four, five. This is actually not uh, not deployed in the in the, in the internal Indian Ocean in the internal Indian Ocean Indian Indonesian Ocean Indian Indonesian seas. Um, the existence of these dots, red uh, black dots here in the Indonesian seas, is simply due to um, um, the currents. Uh, the currents bring those floods under the Indonesian seas. And if you, if you compare from the launch of the Argo floods until today, still um, the Indonesian seas lack of Argo flood me measurements. So this is quite, uh, I myself, I, I don't know why, why, our, why my government does not allow on this kind of measurements because because I think it's quite it's it's pivotal because yeah we can know what is going on in in our oceans. I think that's all from me and thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Risa, for a nice presentation and uh, actually we want to go into the presenter. But uh, I think uh, we will open uh, direct discussion first because I think uh, Dr. Bart uh, got uh, many questions. Uh, so after the discussion, we will continue in the uh, uh, in the third, uh, keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Charles, uh, through unsynchronous. So if any if participant have uh any question uh, to dr Bart or dr isa uh, uh, we will uh, please to raise hand but uh, i see in the chat room a uh, question for dr Bart from uh, professor Mor uh, dr morwan toko uh, uh, could you answer directly in this room uh, in this room uh, Dr. Park, do you still uh, with us? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you can answer the question for uh, Dr. Murwandaka first, as in the well, chat room. Yeah, uh, this is a very, um, I really replied to some of the questions. This is a yeah. very interesting question because actually uh, in open waters is still completely unknown um, about the presence of this uh, parasite. I mean, not completely unknown. There are only a few areas where people are working in order to estimate the, the prevalence. And mostly they are doing by using eDNA techniques just to estimate the presence of the, the spore because it's very difficult to understand like, the impact of the disease on a migratory uh, stock of uh, fish because you know they migrate between river to sea and then from the sea back to the river to, to spawn. So it's really difficult to understand how many fish don't come back because of disease and then specifically because of this disease. But actually we do have uh, some new evidence that this parasite may also resist during the migration to the sea and fish can come back uh, infected. Well, there's still a lot of work to be done in this field to then correlate with the water temperature even more precisely. So any participant want to ask to Dr. Uh, okay, Sab Sabrima, uh, you can uh, question directly. <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Sabrina. Uh, I saw that there are many kinds of mixosomes, especially uh, tetracapsuloides biosalmonae. So, uh, how do you uh, identify this parasite? You know that there are uh, many kinds of uh, key uh, identification key for uh, based on their morphologies or life cycles. So, yeah. how do you do it? Thank you. Yeah, actually, the, the, the morphology has been the, the main uh, way to, to classify uh, mixosome parasite until uh, before the advent of. 
So now everything, all the taxonomy has been uh, revised and people are studying uh, the phylogenetic relationship between uh, mixosomal parasites to link uh, their uh, mixospore with their actinospore stage uh, based on uh, a molecular, basically on the, on the sequence. So the best way is to run uh, some, uh, some PCR and then to, to get the longest uh, product as possible. Uh, you can do either by sequencing the uh, 18S, we normally do the um, 18S, um, about a product of about 800, 900 base pair. Um, but you can also do with some barcoding techniques, um, like uh, targeting other uh, ITS and uh, um, cyclosigenase genes of the, but it really depends which parasite which species you are uh, you want to identify because you may have more or less a specific primer otherwise you can use a, a generic mixosome primers okay thank you very much uh, dr but maybe any Thanks. other question for especially for dr but uh, dr but did you answer the question in the chat room from yes, also. I, and I also okay. shared the, the answer with everybody. No? Okay. Okay. We what a to... very interesting question. A lot okay. of things to study. <laughs> okay. So there is still has any question for Dr. Bart? Because I think uh, you have different time with Indonesia. <laughs> So that's okay. We, yeah. We, Otherwise, you can. Say. I mean, people can also write by by email, or hopefully we'll make during some meeting and, and really oh, okay. keep, keep discussing. Okay. Thank you very much. So, okay. Any participant so want to? Okay. So if uh, there are no question again for Doctor Pat, uh, I think we can uh, move to uh, Doctor Riza. If there any question, uh, and uh, uh maybe dr pat if you have any other two thing to do we, you can uh, still at the zoom or also you can leave from this uh, it's okay okay uh, but i think please uh, give a big applause for dr pat first <laughs> yeah thank you very thank much. you very much okay much appreciated continue uh, sorry uh, i'm sorry come maybe we can take a picture first Okay. Oh, we shall take a picture together first, Doctor Pat, before <laughs> we finish this the session. Okay. Farhana, Farhana, are you ready? Hope you can share this picture then. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please open your camera. I will. Uh, I would like to screen this. Uh, I would like to capture the screen for the presentation. Okay, from the first slide. Okay. Next, the second slide. Yeah, the next slide. Oh, you're doing that. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Bart. Uh, I actually I have three uh, three remarks from your presentation. Uh, the one is uh, water temperature okay, increase, and the, the second is one. oh, sorry. Sure, finish. Thank you. Okay, already finished. Uh, take a picture. Here, yeah, Dr. Bart, uh, I have three words, remarks. Uh, increase the temperature, uh, temperature uh, water temperature, and then suitable condition and uh, modulity of disease factor. <laughs> I think it's important uh, related to this uh, summer cost. And thank you for your present, nice presentation. 
and you can stay uh, in this room uh, or if you have any other to do you can uh, leave from this room okay okay thank, thank you very much yeah. i'll try just to answer okay then. Okay, uh, all participants, if you have any question for Dr. Risa, we still open. Or we will continue to the third speaker. Uh, but we are apologies because uh, Dr. Chilsi Rohman from the University of Toronto uh, could not join uh, directly in this uh, virtual summer course. But uh, she has prepared a video. Uh, or uh, re uh, material regarding her research on microplastic. So I think the committee will play the video for all of you. And then we can continue the uh, discussion session. Hello, committee. Could you play the picture? Okay, I'm going to talk today. I'll give a, a general overview about microplastic pollution, talk about some of the issues and perspectives related to methods. So I'll start by introducing uh, the contaminant. And I'm going to talk about its multidimensionality and how it's unique from other types of contaminants that we, we often tend to think about, like chemical contaminants. Then I'll talk a bit about the method of methodological developments and challenges, things we need to think about, uh, share some of the things we've been working on in our lab, um, and then uh, some of the things I think we should think about as we move forward. So first of all, let me just introduce microplastics. So since I've been researching this contaminant, which has been since about 2007 or 2008, we've learned a lot. And we've learned that microplastics, like other persistent organic pollutants, are incredibly uh, persistent, they're ubiquitous, and they can be toxic. They're not a persistent organic pollutant or haven't been, haven't been designated as this, um, but they certainly have some similarities. They also have some differences. So before I talk to you about some of those differences, I wanna start by just talking about how pervasive this contaminant has become. So plastics are entering the environment at an astounding rate, and they really become an important part of the physical environment in ecosystems worldwide. Researchers have found that they're cycling in the water cycle and the global dust cycle through food webs and also in the carbon cycle. But this contaminant is also unique and I tend to think about it as a diverse and multidimensional contaminant suite. And what do I mean by multidimensional? Well, it's a particle. It in and of itself, itself is obviously made of chemicals, but they're physical particles. They're made out of many different types of polymers. That includes a suite of many different types of additives. They come in different shapes uh, from fibers to fragments to spheres. Those different shapes may impact their fate or maybe their toxicity on animals. They also come in different sizes, and similarly, those different sizes may affect their fate and their toxicity. The other thing about microplastics is that instead of having a half-life where they degrade and go away, they tend to break up into more and more smaller pieces. And because there's so many different types of these materials out in the environment, it's no surprise that they come from many, many different uh, sources, which includes waste. It also includes uh, fishing gear and other maritime sources, but also for microplastic, there are unique sources that are different or that are separate from plastic waste and maritime debris, and that's pre-production plastic pellets, the wear and tear from fibers and textiles, uh, and microbeads and personal care products. They enter the environment from these sources, but often through pathways, which are important, especially when we're thinking about mitigation. So they come in water currents with rivers and also service currents. They come in via the wind and atmospheric cycles, atmospheric deposition as well. Uh, they can also come in direct input to the ocean from wastewater running off of the land or treated effluent. 
And then once they're in the environment, their multidimensionality can affect their fate. So we tend to have ideas and, and knowledge, uh, often from first principles, about how persistent organic pollutants cycle around the world, how they cycle in the atmosphere, and how they cycle in the, in the water. Uh, for microplastics, however, they may, there may be differences, and some of those differences are likely due to that multidimensionality. And for one example is that they're not volatile or semi-volatile like some of these persistent organic pollutants. Again, they're physical particles. In addition, this multidimensionality has to be considered when we think about risk. We know that microplastics can cause toxicity to animals. There's a few um, effect mechanisms that have been studied more than others. As we think about the concentration that may lead to risk thresholds to identify policy decisions, we have to think about, do we report it in, in count of particles per volume of water? Do we report it in mass? And does it need to vary by all of these multidimensional properties like size, shape, polymer type, and additive chemistry? All of these questions at their core, to be able to really answer them and understand them are relevant to methods. We have to be able to analyze this stuff in the environment, and we have to be able to understand certain physical characteristics and properties um, in order to do so. So there are different methods that have been proposed or that are being used around the world. Those include measuring the mass concentration of microplastics through gas chromatography, mass spect spectrometry, um, often with pyrolysis unit at the top, or it's by particle number concentration, often starting with microscopy, but sometimes going straight to spectroscopy, where you get things like the count and the size distribution and the polymer type, and sometimes the shape and the color, all of which can be important for informing sources, understanding the fate, and of course, thinking about the effects. So now I'm gonna talk a bit about the methods and the things that we have to consider when we think about methods it won't be a laundry list, I won't have them all, um, but I'm gonna mention some of the ones I think are really important and share some of the work we've been doing in our lab in order to address these. Now, I never considered myself a methods researcher or a methods scientist. Uh, it was, I guess, never my goal, um, but it has, um, it has been a lot of my work, and that is because, as I said, in order to answer these questions, you need methods. And so we've probably spent a fair chunk of our time in our laboratory uh, thinking about this stuff. And when we think about methods, we want to think about uh, sampling all the way to sample extraction, sample analysis, and all the way through to reporting. So I'll go through each one, some of the things to consider, and then share a bit about what we've done related to each. First of all, when it comes to sampling, we really have to always, I think when we think about any method, think about the objective and our question going into our research. Then we need to think about the sample volume. How much volume of water or sediment or animal do we need to sample in order to get a representative sample from what is in nature? What is the sampling method that we should use? Will it be bulk water sampling filtered through a small, small mesh? Or will it be a mantatrol, which has a larger mesh on the back, sometimes up to one millimeter, often around 330 microns? When we sample, how many replicates will we take? Will we take one large toe in one location? Or will we duplicate our effort at each location to understand variability? And as we sample, will we take field blanks to be able to account for that procedural contamina contamination? And that field blank can also come into the lab acting as a lab blank. So we've explored some of these things through a couple different projects. I'll share with you some of what we've discovered or, or trends we've seen through a project with the San Francisco Estuary Institute, quantifying and characterizing microplastics in the San Francisco Bay. In this study, we took mantatrol samples as well as bulk water samples from the exact same location at the same time uh, from, a, from a sailboat uh, within the San Francisco Bay. What we're looking at here in this uh, figure is the particles per liter, so the concentration of microplastics on the y-axis. And each one of these are duplicate samples taken back to back. So not only were these samples taken at the same time, but there were duplicates taken back to back uh, for each type of sample. And so the first thing I want you to notice is that you have a much higher concentration of microplastics in the, in the uh, grab sample than the manta, but we'll talk about that more in the next slide. Here, I want you to focus on 
the variability between duplicates. You see much smaller variability with a Manta sample when you have a whole lot of water, and you see much greater variability with a low volume grab sample. Now, these are very low, one liter. I don't recommend sampling with this low of a volume. Um, but if you do, absolutely take field du duplicates <clears throat> to be able to understand the variability. So the lower the volume, the more important those duplicates become. As I said earlier, you can see here that the concentration of microparticles is much higher in a grab sample than in the Manta. This is for two reasons. One is when you're using a smaller mesh size on a grab sample, you're going to have more particles because you're capturing more of the small stuff. The other reason, though, is because is, I'm not sure what the reason is, but there's a lot of work done across the field where people have been taking grab samples um, and they've been taking Manta samples. And when you have a smaller volume, they're finding that smaller volume samples tend to have a higher concentration. Now, this may be because simply of the mesh size, but it's something to further be explored. When you have a smaller volume grab sample next to a manta, we tend to find that the manta is more representative of the shapes and morphologies and types of plastics we see in the environment. However, I've also seen we've been doing a systematic review and meta analysis comparing these two methods and with a high enough volume for a grab sample, these could be equal. But you absolutely, I think if you're taking grab samples, the take home messages, make sure you take enough volume. Okay, now let's think about things to consider when it comes to sample extraction. Now, of course, the first thing is gonna be the extraction method, which is gonna vary, of course, by the matrix that you're sampling in. And that may tell you whether you do a density separation, some sort of just a simple filtration, maybe for clean drinking water, or whether it's digestion of biota, fish tissue, or even a, a really dirty manta sample with a um, peroxide oxidation method. No matter what, whatever method we use, the most important thing we should think about is recovery and precision. How well are we recovering the particles we aim to, to recover in our sample? We should always have lab blanks, which if you've taken field blanks can be carried over. Um, this is to account for procedural contamination. I think it's really important that those blanks go through the entire process, same as your sample. I don't think putting a filter out in a lab is the solution because that is a very different process than what the sample actually goes through. So I think similar to analytical chemistry, we should have lab blanks that mimic our sampling and sample prep. And then the next question is, do we subsample? We don't hear a lot of people talk about subsampling at the extraction phase. We hear a lot of people talking more about subsampling at the analytical chemistry phase, um, but I'll talk a little bit later why I think this phase could potentially be uh, a, another place to consider doing it. But the examples that I'll show you here are gonna mostly be around extraction. There have been a lot of different extraction methods that have been proposed. Some of them are quite novel. We have been guilty of this. Uh, for example, we have a, a, a manuscript that describes a study led by Brian Nguyen and Yelena Gerbic, where they magnetized the plastic using a solvent and iron nanoparticles and a magnet. They were able to extract microplastics from different types of samples, and this included uh, larger than one millimeter plastics of many different polymer types, very small 10 to 20 micron plastics with decent recovery and across a, a wide range of matrices. However, the reality is I'm not sure we're gonna pick these types of novel methods if we're trying to harmonize around one method. And the most important thing is we need to think about recovery and we need to think about precision as we determine a best method for matrices, particularly as places around the world lead towards monitoring, which is what's happening right now, which I think is fantastic. So in our lab, the other thing we've been working on because we're collaborating with the um, Southern California uh, Coastal Water Research Project, SCORP, and the State Water Board to do a method evaluation study uh, in, for the state of California, but really there are participants across the world. And for that, we had to send up samples that we spiked. We knew what were in them. Actually, uh, Thermal Fisher is heavily involved in this project as well as one of the labs helping with this project. Um, so we spiked samples, we know what's in them, we send them out, we send out an SOP, uh, and we also did some training for people who are new, and we asked people how many years of experience they have in microplastics. One of the things we've learned is as you set up these extraction techniques in your lab, experience and training matters. So we put our training materials on our website uh, if people are curious to take a look, and this work has largely been led by Hannah DeFrond and Keenan Muneau, who are researchers in my lab. 
So again, experience and training matters. As you choose your method with recovery and precision, it can be improved uh, over time with experience and also training protocols that help keep subjectivity as much as possible out of the lab, right? There will always be a human dimension. The next thing to consider is uh, sample analysis, right, so, or chemical analysis. So once you have taken your sample, you've extracted your sample, you've uh, potentially you counted your sample under a microscope, and now it's time to determine how many polymer types do you have within your sample. So here the first question is, what is the type of analysis that you will use? Will it be a spectroscopy using Raman or FTIR? Or will it be mass spectrometry? Are you actually interested in the mass concentration of each different polymer type? Or are you interested in the type of chemicals? And of course, mass spec can also be used particle by particle and sometimes does well with complex particles like tire dust. What polymer spectral libraries will you use? The, what's available in your library will help you better pin down the types of contaminants or microplastics in your sample. How do you present your sample to the instrument? That'll affect how you prepare your sample, sample preparation. The limit of detection of your um, equipment, this should, should be reported in studies. It isn't always, and we've been guilty of that too. And then again, this question of subsampling. We see a lot of people across the literature subsampling uh, either the particles from a sample to figure out what is in them or subsampling from a filter. So I'll talk a bit about libraries and then I'll talk about subsampling because that's some of what we've been thinking about uh, quite a bit in our lab. So first of all, when it comes to libraries, in our lab, we've developed SLOP and FLOP, which is the Spectral Library of Plastic Particles for Raman, SLOP Raman, and then FLOP is the FTIR Library of Plastic Particles. Uh, FLOP is coming soon. It's been led by Hannah DeFrond in my lab and in close collaboration again with Thermo Fisher. Um, and SLOP is already uh, published in the literature and freely available on our website. So our goal here is to make open access libraries that are loaded with spectra from plastic particles that come that look more like the plastic that we are commonly analyzing. So right now, often when you get an instrumentation, the library has pure particles, they are colorless, um, and they're kind of perfect. And we all know from the microplastics research that those microplastic samples aren't perfect. They come in a range of colors, they come in a range of sizes and shapes, they have different additive chemistries, and sometimes they've been weathered in nature. So we've created spectral libraries using both types of instrumentation that incorporate this diversity. So we include many different colors of each polymer type, we include different shapes, and we include both samples from the environment that we've taken in different studies, as well as pure, not pure, but particles off the shelf that have been broken down and used in this study. One of the things that we find uh, with this is for SLOP is that we have a lot of particles for Raman that sometimes we can't figure out what polymer type they are. This is because the laser absorbs um, the dark color and we, can't, we get a pretty messy uh, spectrum. This is sometimes because of band overlay with the additives. Uh, this can just be because the hit quality index isn't good because it's not something recognizable in the pure polymer library. And so we took many of these particles I think about 60 to 100 of them, and we re-ran them once we had SLOP and SLOPY. SLOPY is just the environmental particles within our instrumentation, so set up on our Raman. And here we find that now we have less particles with this unknown signal, and we're more likely to be able to tell what they are. And we often get our own libraries popping up over the other libraries. Now for FTIR, this isn't out yet, we're still working on it, but in our lab, as we start to use FLOP, we're finding a similar thing, particularly for pesky particles like tire wear rubber. Okay, so now let's talk about subsampling. Um, this is something I think about a lot. I look across the literature and I think a lot of us are subsampling without giving it a lot of thought of um, why we're doing it and are we sure that the sample, the, the method that we're using is representative. I think it's really important that we report on the objective of our subsampling, and then we also report on how we know that it is uh, providing us the representative answer that we are trying to get. So I think when we subsample, there are two reasons that I'm going to propose. 
One is that you're just trying to understand how many of the particles that you picked via microscopy are actually anthropogenic and plastic versus natural particles. So how accurate is your picking under Raman? For this, you might want to be producing some sort of pie chart here where you can tell a reader the percent that is not plastic. And maybe this is to extrapolate to a sample. In order to do that, to ask this question, how many particles do you need to take from every sample if this is your objective? We got samples from around the world from people who were who had collected all of the particles and who had analyzed via spectroscopy every single particle. We then used computer simulation to basically pick particles over and over again, continue uh, doing many, many replicates and to see how many particles do you have to take to get under a 20% error in building a pie chart like this from the true sample. And what you see here on these graphs that I'm gonna show you is the summed error. So we're trying to get under this uh, dotted line and the number of particles that you have to chemically characterize in order to be below a 20% error. We also ask the question, when you subsample, do you do it randomly, any particle that you that is in your sample, or do you do it by like choosing five of each color, for example, or five of each shape, or by color category, so five of each blue fiber, five of each black fragment, et cetera. We found actually that random is just as good as anything else, if not better, which is great. That means you don't have to worry so much about color and morphology. And so if you don't care about it in your sample, it doesn't matter for this purpose. We also found that here you can sample from just about any of the samples we looked at, 25 particles uh, was the, like to get to be able to get what you wanted in every single sample, 25 particles from every sample would get you there. Here's another, my second reason why I think people might be subsampling. This one's a little bit tough. I, I think uh, this is if you're truly trying to capture the diversity of polymer types present in your sample. So now I'm not just interested in whether it's plastic or not. I'm actually interested in the types of polymers in my sample. So here, we want to capture the diversity within our sample, uh, but one of the things we found is that it actually looks like we might not we might not even be sampling enough to capture all of the particle types that are in the environment, and that's a different story, and we won't dig into that today. But in any case, we were thinking about it from a bit of a community or a, um, from a community ecology perspective, thinking about a rarefaction curve, looking at our samples, and recognizing that as we sample from the environment, our curves weren't flattening at the top, and it was suggesting maybe we need more volume. But in any case, for this study, we, we worked off of the samples that we had, and basically we found the same thing. Random is just as good, if not better, than other types of sampling. However, now you have to sample a lot of particles uh, in order to capture that diversity. People might not have the time to sample this many particles, so it's really important to think about, again, what is your objective for subsampling and make sure that you're capturing that. This is work led by Hannah DeFran and also in collaboration with Anna O'Brien from our lab. Um, not published yet, but uh, getting to that writing stage. Finally, when it comes to subsampling, we thought about subsampling from a filter. So Clara Tyson in our lab led this work. Uh, and the reason we were doing this is because we were considering subsampling from, from a filter. And we looked across the literature and it looked like people were doing it, but it didn't look like there was any uh, clear role of how they were doing it representatively. So we tried it out. We filtered many different samples. We tried many different ways to subsample. Do you randomly put squares on a filter? Do you draw rings around it and do a square in each ring? Do you do pizza pies? We never got anything that was representative of that subsample if you scaled up. Nothing was ever below a 20% uh, coefficient of variability. And what we found, though, is that you always get this kind of sunburst pattern and that you have a lot of particles in the, little, the middle and less as you go out. And you can see this from the filters here, more particles in the middle and less as you go out. So this suggests that you have some sort of pattern that maybe you can work off of. But because this seems to be tricky, it also suggests maybe we should subsample from the liquid, homogenizing your liquid and subsampling from that and putting less particles on the filter so you don't have to subsample your filter. And I think that's our recommendation for now. Other things to consider that I won't go into great detail about are QAQC. Uh, there have been papers written. There was a um, special issue in applied spectroscopy that came out last year. Also part of this, the Southern California Coastal a water research project program on method evaluation study. We've published a special issue 
we had a couple uh, papers about QAQC and the things you need to consider, reporting on lab contamination, uh, reporting on recovery, et cetera. Um, it's really important to think about our units of measurement. Uh, when we think about reporting, we need to report what they are, and we also wanna make sure that they, they're kind of transferable across the literature so that people can do meta-analyses. And I personally think it's important to make our data open access. We've sort of been in the habit of throwing our CSV files and Excel sheets and data sheets online as we publish. And I think this is really useful as we try to synthesize information around the world to really try to understand this contaminant. Okay, and the final thing I wanna say is just a few thoughts on the things I think we should be thinking about as we move forward. In order to answer some of these questions in terms of the multidimensionality of plastics, we should be working towards more harmonized protocols, not necessarily a standard protocol that everyone uses, although that may be desired in certain states and provinces or countries as monitoring programs are put in place, but harmonized protocols are really important that have clear reporting guidelines. What are the types of things we wanna see in a manuscript or in a report in order to be able to trust the data? Recovery, for example, could be one of them. Um, making sure you report the size of your material, your hit quality index, whatever we decide is important. Um, we need better streamlined and high throughput methods. This is where a lot of the manufacturing uh, companies really come in. They've been making huge leaps and bounds over the years. Um, and that's really helped, right? Help us improve our, our accuracy and our precision, but also the amount of time it takes to process a sample. We've thought a lot about whether we need standardized morphology and color keys for particle characterization. I think color and shape are important to help us understand the source, but it's subjective. And then of course, clear QAQC guidelines, as I mentioned before, we need clear clean lab techniques that are expected of us. We should think about whether we require matrix spikes or at least some sort of way to report on your recovery within your extraction protocol in your lab. Blank sampling, I think, is really important, whether it's field blanks and lab blanks or field blanks that carry into lab blanks. And then how do we correct? Are we blank correcting or are we simply just reporting? And what's our limit of, of detection? Should it be based on the size of the particle, the concentration of the particle, or the amount above the blanks? or a combination of all. Of course, it's gonna matter whether you're using mass spectrometry or uh, spectroscopy, um, because some of these things are gonna be relevant to one and not the other. But I think these things are all really important. And while we can look to the field of analytical chemistry to guide us, and we should, um, we also have to remember the differences. So I'm gonna leave you again with this slide one more time to just remind you that this is a, uh, it's a diverse contaminant, it's a multi-dimensional contaminant, and not all microplastics are the same. And as we develop our field moving forward, uh, we can't forget that, uh, that this is the case. Um, and make sure that we move forward accordingly. And with that, um, I wanna thank you. I also wanna thank Thermo Fisher for inviting me to this workshop and collaborating with us over the years. Okay. Is that beautiful? I think so already finished. Okay, thank you very much for the good presentation of virtually by Dr. Terasi Rohman from uh, University of Toronto. And we will continue uh, discussion session because I see there are many questions, especially for Dr. Riza. Uh, you can answer, answer the question directly from uh, in this uh, room. Thank you, uh, Dr. Agastavidi. Um, yeah, thank you for the questions uh, from Ms. Hanindia Fairuzia. Um, um, I think she is our student, right? <laughs> yeah, one, one way to differentiate between phytoplankton or sedum is that we should further analyze the remote sensing, remote sensing spectral reflectance or normalized living water radiance. So, um, yeah, we, uh, we, we should analyze the, the 
RRS remote sensing spectral reference of triple five, uh, the wavelength of triple five. This is for for the uh, sedum or suspended sediment, um, uh, and then the RSS, the RRS of four four three. Correct me if I wrong. Um, is used to separate or or is used to is used to identify the phytoplankton. So by analyzing those two different remote sensing spectral reflectants, we can really distinguish between sedum and and phytoplankton. And uh, yeah. If you would like to further discuss in detail, maybe we can we can we can meet each other in campus. For the question uh, of Miss Indrian Riska Amalia, uh, this is very good questions, and I I to be honest, I I, I don't know uh, the exact conditions that you you have there. I mean, uh, you said that. You have a control pond, so this pond's control means there is no influence of of uh, surrounding environmental or 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 I mean in the lab or really isolated or uh, doesn't have interaction with nature. So I don't know what what do you mean here, but um, in my experience when filtering the water samples um, it really depends on the sample itself i mean the original the uh, when the when the water samples came from very good environment uh, to my knowledge or in my experience the phytoplankton or, or the planktons are usually uh, uh, represent the water quality itself so um yeah to be honest i i i cannot answer your your questions because you said that uh, you have already filtered and then sterilized with heat and and chemical but you still have found nitsia and cyanopita so i don't know what what is the cause for the existence for the existence of of those two uh, species? Probably, do you know the answer, Paiko? Do you know the answer about that? Not too much. <laughs> Not too much. Yeah, sorry. I yeah, that's that's what I can give. I mean, that's the best answer I can give to you, Miss Miss uh, Indrian. Okay, thank you, Dr. Riza. Still has any question? I think it already answered all. Okay, the distinguished participant, uh, I would like to inform to you that uh, the question uh, to Dr. Chelsea, uh, the committee will collect all question and then uh, send to her, and we will confirm after the uh, we get uh, the answer. So I'm apologies for this uh, situation. Uh, any other question? Okay, maybe we we are uh, we in the end of this session. Uh, uh, I have uh, several notes, but I already uh, read uh, uh, read. Um, especially from the topic uh, Dr. Risa, uh, one, uh, one note, I think it's very important, uh, one mark, uh, temperature anomaly at the ocean depth from year to year make indicated uh, global temperature change, uh, hence uh, observation of annual seasonal and interannual var variability of the ocean is uh, necessary, especially in Indonesia that uh, there is still a lack of uh, data. The, okay. uh, before we end this session, please give a big applause to all speaker, especially to Dr. Riza. Thanks for your kind attention to all participants and apologize uh, if 
any mistake uh, uh, in getting on this session uh, see you uh, next time and i uh, we have still uh, we still have uh, 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 about 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes uh, break before the next agenda by committee. But uh, uh, keep staying in the Zoom uh, at the fourth, uh, 13 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. See you.
Il y a ma tournée du terrain, bon, vraiment, tu reviens fatigué. <rire> ah, le problème que ils ont, c'est qu'on a, ah bon, non seulement ça, c'est contraignant aussi. Qui...
Hello, Mr. Tony, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Can we get start? Okay, Purade. We can start. I think you still mute. Oh, sorry. Hello? Yeah, I have your voice. Oh, okay, thank you. Can we get start or just wait for a moment? Yeah, I think we can start, Purade. Okay. Well, hello everyone. So welcome to our sessions. It's a pleasure to join with all of you. I'm Rati and also Dr. Tony will be your instructor uh, in the sessions. And I think we have already uh, listened uh, and get many new insights, I think, from the next presentations uh, from uh, delivered by Dr. Bartolomeo about emerging mixozoan parasites to warmer northern fresh water. Also about seasonal and interannual variability in the Indonesian seas by Dr. Riza, and also the videos about microplastic uh, from Dr. Chelsea. So I guess now we get a uh, better understanding about this topic, right? <coughs> and I think now uh, it's time to have fun, I think, Dr. Tony and also the participants. So if it's possible, uh, could you please turn on your camera uh, because we just get relaxed and refresh our minds and with the simple game, I think. So if it's possible, please turn your camera. But if not, it's okay. Uh, uh, we can, we can uh, start, Dr. Tony. So maybe you can guide uh, this Mentimeter. Time is yours, Dr. Tony. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Rate. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the summer course uh, activities. And as Dr. Rate said that, uh, please turn on your camera if you don't mind. And at this time, uh, we will have some uh, class activities and I think uh, it will be fun because uh, we already prepare uh, some question games uh, using uh, Mentimeter. Uh, yes, I think just a simple game, yes, so don't worry, it's just a game, I think. And, yeah, it's just a game, uh, just question game. It. Yeah, uh, I just want to know that, uh, have you used a Mentimeter before? Let me know. Mentimeter? <coughs> no? Okay, I will uh, explain. Uh, you just go to uh, menti.com and then put the code uh, as shown in the screen. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, I, I don't have an access uh, to share my screen. Okay, maybe uh, Afida? Okay, okay, okay yeah, it's, it's okay. Well, uh, this is Mentimeter. And if you're ready, uh, we can go uh, to this uh, first question game. And uh, you just go to menti.com and then uh, put the code as shown in the screen. And then uh, you can use your laptop or smartphone and uh, you can answer this, this question. The question is, which fisheries product do you prefer? You can choose uh, number one or number two, number three or number four, uh, or you can uh, add, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, so, yeah some of you already uh, give the answer. And let me see. Uh, here oh. we have yeah five six I'm still six, number yeah, one. six uh, <coughs> answers and still going on I think please uh, you can uh, <clears throat> give an answer I think I I will give you uh, three minutes to write your answers it's easy right yeah fifteen. Uh, persons 
already uh, give the answer. I think here uh, there are 16, 60, 60 person, 60 participants. Please give your, your answer. You can use your laptop or your smartphone. We just want to know uh, about uh, the most answers. Wow, fish will be number one now. Yeah, fish still number one. And uh, lobster in second. Number two. <laughs> 25 participants already give the answers. Please give your answers. Yeah. 28. Wow. Yeah, good, good, good. Okay, finish. Hello, Tony. One more minute. Time is up. Okay. Okay. Okay, we have 32 uh, participants and most answers are fish. Yeah, good. Yeah. Fish still number one. Okay, enough. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I think we can go to the to the next uh, to the next question. Oh, still going on. The answer. Okay. We can stop this, Dr. Ate. Okay, thank you. And then okay. Yeah. Okay, second. <clears throat> Next question. Question. Yeah, what kind of fishes do you consume a lot? You can go to yes. menti.com and put the code uh, as shown in the screen. Yes, yeah. because I think uh, <laughs> lele goreng. Lele goreng, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so okay. Maybe because uh, every country maybe have to let us uh, prefer about uh, different fish, I think. So maybe it's be different answer. Oh, I think this just Indonesian <laughs> chakal and catfish. I'm waiting for the uh, rare answer. Catfish with hot sauce. Wow. Jangan langsung kasu kagut. Me too. I also like chaka lang suka suka. 22. 20. I think the person can yeah. joke. The answer is still maybe. going on. <clears throat> so the, the, the biggest, uh, what is the biggest uh, word? Is this um, the most answer like that, Mr. Tony? Yeah. Uh, from here, we can see that the most answers are tilapia, Tuna and catfish. I think uh, three these three commodities are uh, recognized in the world. <laughs> <Most likely. laughs> yeah, milkfish, salmon. Okay, maybe some volunteers will give some uh, what is that opinion? Maybe maybe some volunteers. Please raise your hand. Okay, so just tilapia, a catfish, tuna, or oh, chakra suka suka, I think so. <laughs> Good, and milk paste, okay. Still 40 participants. I think uh, someone <laughs> outside Indonesia should uh, mention uh, fish species that, that uh, are not exist in Indonesia, but mm -hmm. here I I just see uh, salmon, mm -hmm. red Good. salmon. Uh, 
you give some uh, opinions why you like that piece. Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> Catfish attached to mint chili sauce, still the best. <laughs> Good, from Sobina. The next game? Next game? Okay. Thanks to the next. Time is limited, I think. Uh, stop share. And then let me change to another question. Uh, yeah. This is. Uh, Oh, sorry. This question is related to the topic that we yes, already yes. Uh, get in the course meeting before. So the question is, please describe two words about microplastic. Please okay, give please. your answer. Yeah. Ecotoxic, yes, yes. Destructive cause. Mm -hmm. Persistent, okay. Dangerous. Most answer are dangerous. We can wait for uh, one or two minutes to see what's the most answer. Yeah. Still moving. <laughs> so uh, the dangerous is no. Yeah. The, the, the answer is mm -hmm. still going on. Dangerous, still number one. Yeah, 75 participants, but uh, you know, 37 participants. Uh, yeah. Join this game. <clears throat> thirty-seven participant. I think uh, we have uh, mm -hmm. answer from thirty-seven participant, and most answer uh, is dangerous. Yeah, dangerous is, is yeah. Microplastic is dangerous, so uh, we need to be uh, careful. Okay. Uh, well, uh, let uh, wait, wait, Doctor Tommy. Maybe as uh, from this wallet inside, I think maybe some uh, particip uh, some participants or any volunteer wants to what's that uh, to explain about uh, all their words here, uh, which uh, what is that to make some how is that conclusion or uh, whatever. Okay, maybe uh, any volunteer to uh, to explain about uh, the microplastic. Uh, related with these words, maybe. Want to try? Any volunteers? <laughs> Please go ahead. Please go ahead. We just want to hear your your opinion about yes. uh, microplastic. No, there's no. <laughs> No volunteer? Maybe Dr. Tony, you will try. No, or but Miss Desi, maybe you want to try? Uh can I try? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Shafiq. Shafiq. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Because uh, <laughs> according to the the this term is the um, the dangerous of microplastic. And so I know microplastic is is something that is like a normal plastic that, that we are using, like uh the food wrappers or a container which were exposed like to a sun radiations or intense heat and after some time it will degrade to a smaller size and eventually to a not even micro it, it can go to a nano nano size which can which cannot be seen by naked eyes the danger of this plastic as what i know is is because this this plastic is absorbed it's not absorbed absorbed is like sponges but absorbed is something like if you put like uh, an oil in a plastic container you can see the stain right and that stain uh, can retain in our body and that is uh, one of the causes that lead to the cancer that's what i know that's why uh, oh. we can say the passing is dangerous uh, microplastic is dangerous 
Yes, we're great. Very nice. Uh, yeah. Sharing from Malaysia. Very nice <laughs> answer. Yeah, very nice and very complete answers. I think. Uh, congratulations, Safik Ayman from Malaysia. Yeah. Thank you, Safik. Okay. Maybe okay. any other volunteers? The last before we close this game. Wants to try? No. Okay, Dr. Tony. Maybe it's time to uh, finish uh, our games and. Um, Thank you for uh, the participants for having fun with us and sharing your opinions. And uh, I'm afraid this uh, time is up and we still have an uh, agenda and it will be delivered by uh, Dr. Injun, maybe uh, Dr. Injun, please. Okay, Dr. Rati, uh, my voice is clearly heard, Bu Rati. Yes, yes, your voice is okay. clear. Yes, okay. clear. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Burati and Pak Tony, for the very fun game. I also um, feel your question. Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, my name is Indun. I am the representative from the uh, event division. So um, this maybe we will take around fifteen to twenty minutes to have your opinion and suggestion because our team actually has already uh, constructed the curriculum, um, including the schedule, the activities hour, and also the assignment. So after we have two days of event of the course, uh, we would like to hear your opinion about the um, this event, especially for the um, lectures and also the assignment because we received several uh, question and also the suggestion regarding the um, different time and location which uh, makes some participants um, uh, difficult to um, enroll to this course and also we um, received the suggestion about the assignment which for some participants is um, probably quite difficult to be uh, done together in a group. So uh, may I have your um, opinion or your suggestion about the first uh, assignment first? Because actually, uh, if I uh, could give you the information, uh, we created this assignment actually to provide the um, environment of uh, learning by uh, for the active discussion and also we really hope that uh, during the uh, discussion it has the uh, cross-cultural exchange and also you can make a networking from each uh, other participant and also discuss about some topic about the fisheries which uh, i believe that all the participant has their own uh, point of view so we really hope that this uh, assignment actually for the uh, active discussion and also, I would like to um, tell all the participants that uh, the committee has the main principle, which is we would like to serve our best to all the participants. And also, we would like to provide like the unforgettable experience for all the participants who attend this course. So therefore, we really hope that the assignment is like a fun activities for all the uh, participants. So uh, all the uh, assignment actually is not a really serious like in the uh, in the schools, but actually the main objective is the active discussion, networking, and uh, exchange some information. So we have two um, assignment. First is the um, fisheries in uh, your countries. Actually, with this assignment, we would like to have the uh, share from the participant about the unique or the interesting uh, fishery sector from uh, your country, because we see that um, many uh, participants come from not only from Indonesia, but also from other parts of the world, like um, Japan, and also we have Malaysia, and we have like Algeria, and also the Bahamas that Actually, for me, I really don't know about the fisheries in their country. So I think this is the occasion, um, the, um, uh, the occasion that uh, we can know uh, each other um, 
by different culture and also uh, different situation in our countries. So for the first assignment, may I have your um, opinion? Is it um, actually uh, easy to be done for all the participants? Um, can I have the opinion from the Indonesian first? Because many of the participants from Indonesia, um, may I have your opinion? Is there any volunteers from Indonesian participant? Or may I um, ask directly to the person, probably? Can I have your opinion, uh, Miss Lutfia? Are you there? Hello? Miss Lutfia Rifka from uh, Group 8. Uh, hello, hello, Miss Indin. Good afternoon. Hello. Is my voice is clear? Yes. yes. Uh, so for me, uh, summer course, uh, no, nothing a problem with the time in Indonesia. Okay. Yes. And uh, what about the first assignment about the fisheries in Indonesian country? Because uh, in the first uh, event in the pre-course, we actually uh, make a big group of Indonesian participant to present the um, uh, Indonesian fisheries. Is it possible to be done for your groups so far? Uh, I think uh, my, my group is still discussed for the first assignment. And oh, okay. I think we can we can finish there. Uh, inshallah. Okay, thank you. So may I have another opinion, Miss Irene Yasmin? Hello. How are you? You are from which group? Uh, I'm from group three. Group three, okay. So uh, you have the uh, combined with the group four, right? For the first uh, assignment. Uh uh, before that, I, I want to say that this is my first time to attend a attend summer course. Yeah, uh, and I just uh, di diploma degree. Maybe okay. <laughs> here too much people who uh, better than me. No, no, no. We are all okay. the same here. Uh, so uh, uh, if I have to um give an opinion oh, i'm i was i i'm so excited and this is uh um make make my what <laughs> i'm sorry this uh if i have okay. to speak english uh well well i <laughs> sorry sorry <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. My, yeah, this is my first time, so uh, I don't have too much of uh, pengalaman. So okay, <laughs> experience. Uh -huh, experiences. Uh, and I have to maybe learning about the material before uh, because uh, I can to uh, yeah speak English fluent and her. English fluent juga. I I don't I don't good at all. Yeah, and maybe I have to more more learning about the material. Is like have to read again and because yeah. But of of all of this summer course, yeah, I think it's very very. This is good, very nice, and apa? Yeah, maybe it's it's, it's all that of me because I'm so gugupi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. But so far, the discussion in your groups is going well. Oh, uh, maybe not because uh, we don't. Uh, not not too many sharing about the maybe this is uh the met the. What this uh. The topic is have done in WhatsApp group. Maybe after this, we okay. can go discuss. to discuss about that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Miss Irene. 
Yep, you're welcome. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. So may I have the opinion from um, other than Indonesian? So I see we have Miss. I'm sorry if I spell your uh, name wrong. Hon Hong Po No. Hello. How can I call your name? Hong Pono Jer um Germain. <clears throat> Can you hear my voice? Okay, probably um there is some signal trouble. May I move to uh Miss or Mr. Hadirah from Malaysia? Hello, Mr. or Miss Hadirah, are you there? Okay, probably from other Malaysia, if I see... Um... Malaysian. Mr. Abdullah Al Asif. Oh, okay. Mr. Abdullah. Hello. Hello. How are you? Fine. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, how do you feel so far with the uh, course and also the assignment? Is it any difficulties? I'm so sorry, but uh, I'm handling some stuff, and uh, uh, currently I'm, I'm on route. I'm on on way to to back uh, dormitory, so it's it's very difficult to. I don't I don't receive with the assignment, and uh, also a. Uh, I need to, is it possible to, to send it uh, in my email? Or, uh, I don't know the best way, but I, 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 don't, I, I don't have opportunity to, I don't, I don't get the assignment right now. Okay. Okay, so, so you are not um, invited in the WhatsApp group? Uh, not yet. Okay. So maybe uh, Miss Desi can help you after this to assign you in the WhatsApp group. Do, okay. do you have WhatsApp? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's good. What, what's a good? We will be perfect for me. Okay. 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 Miss Desi, please uh, follow up this after the, the session. Please. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so may I have another from, oh, we have from Myanmar. From Myanmar. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I cannot um, spell your name well, but is it? Uh, Myanmar, Myanmar, Mr. Nain. Mr. Nain Ye. In group eight. And also group six, and then cluster nine ye win. <laughs> yes. Hello, Mr. Nine Ye Win. Hello, are you there, Mr. Nine Ye Win? Okay, maybe. Another Miss Nandar line. I'm sorry if I'm mistaken spelling your name. Mr. Nandar from Myanmar. Okay, no answer. So let me go through. We have participant from Australia. 
uh, from Australia. Where is it? Um, <laughs> Sorry, I tried to find your I name. Am okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I saw it, but then I tried to find it. Yeah. Hi. It's nice. Hello. Hello. It is nice experience to join this summer course. As you can see my face. Originally, I am Indonesian. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but at the moment, I'm living in Australia for studying my PhD. So I'm going uh, to be an Australia representative. Okay. Now it is a big challenge to provide information uh, related to fisheries and aquaculture in this country. But yeah, I will try and collect some references. Yeah. Okay. So you, you will share the fisheries in Australia in uh, the next session? Mm, maybe in, the last in the, the last, last session last, the last presentation of this month okay okay I found the date yeah the schedule uh, on 26 i think okay so can't wait to see your share about uh, fisheries yeah. in australia so only yeah. you yourself only one participant from australia or you have another participant yeah, only me because okay. I found the flyer from my friends from Indonesia and okay. I registered to be uh, join this summer course. The okay. difficulty is only about the different time between Indonesia and Australia. What time is it now, Miss Kamsia? Uh, Isha time. Okay. Almost eight. So, yeah, maybe and that's only the difficulty because as PhD, I have to spend time in uh, office for morning until afternoon. And then I back to my house and starting to join the summer course okay. until, yeah, Late until night. night. Okay. So, <laughs> but that's okay. Okay, thank you very much. Who comes? Yes, yeah. you're welcome. Okay, thank may you. I have another person from? I saw this is from Algeria. It is very far from Indonesia. Mr. or Miss Mokrani Ahmed. I believe Mr. Mr. Mokrani. Hello. Mr. Mokrani Ahmed from Algeria. Hello, are you there? Okay, no answer. I think I have all or the country, different countries of participant. Am I miss some country which already joined in this Zoom? Okay, so I think the first assignment about fisheries in your countries probably doesn't uh, have any problem to be done together. Am I right? Or probably an, um, participants would like to give some opinion about this? Okay. Okay, so I believe we can still um, uh, do this assignment for the um, first assignment. And uh, please make this assignment is like for sharing to uh, another participant. So don't make this assignment as like a serious assignment that make you uh, stressed or um, um, apa, stressful or uh, make you difficult to uh, do it. 
Okay, so that is the first assignment. And may I go to the second assignment? So we have the report from the student affair that some of the groups has already choose the um, topic for the uh, final presentation, but some of the groups uh, has already uh, did not um, decide the topic for the final presentation yet. Therefore, for those groups which uh, have not um, decided their topics, we make or we choose the topic for the for the groups. And I believe that Miss Desi has already shared the um, topic. Am I right, Miss Desi? Okay, so you can see from the uh, or maybe if I could share my screen. Uh, This one. Okay. Okay, so we have 10 groups and we divide 10 uh, topics for each um, groups. So the black one is the topic which is already decided by the groups. But the orange one the, for group four, five, seven, eight, and 10, um, we received the information that the groups has uh, not um, decided the topic yet. So we try to help the groups. Okay, thank you. We decide to uh, choose the topic for the groups, like for group four about the disease outbreak, group five about aqua feed, group seven about seafood industrial waste, group eight about seafood clean processing, and group 10 about seafood presentation. Preservation, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, edit this one. Okay, so um, uh, may I have the opinion from the representative of group four? I believe that the other groups that has already decided the, the uh, topics, probably the, dis the dis discussion is going well and you have already uh, decided together about the topics. Uh, group four, any representative from group four? Miss Desi, can you help me? Okay, maybe Mr. Mr. Muhammad Sejuddin, would you like to give the opinion for this topic for your group? Hello, Mr. Muhammad Sejuddin. Can you hear my voice clear? Mr. Sejuddin? Probably he's not there, Miss Desi. Is there any other representative from group four? Okay, maybe we agree with the topic. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, for representative group, group five. Is there any participant from group five? Okay, Hello? I will call Miss Nahla. Hello, Nahla, Miss Nahla Alfia Tunisa. Hello, Miss Nahla. Yes. I'm here in Indon. Yes, so we decide this topic for your group. Is it okay about aqua feed? Yes, I think it's okay because in our group yesterday, we have uh, some discussion about the aquaculture topic. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So next group seven. Okay, okay. I will call. Yes. Sorry, Mr. In, uh, Ms. Indun. Uh, yes. I think the second and third topic also uh, the committee uh, choose to start about invasive species. Oh, also, oh sorry. Also, it is all, uh, okay, sorry. decided by the committee. Okay, sorry, sorry. The two and three, right? Ms. Yes. Rati? Okay, may I go uh, back again to group two?
Is there any representative, Miss Desi, from group two? Okay, I will call Miss Rohana. Oh, Miss Rohana. Hello, Miss Rohana. Emma. Emma. Hello, Miss Rohana. Uh, or uh, Mr. Harya Bimasuchi. Hello, Mr. Harya. Okay, I will uh, call Mr. Kelvin on. Hello. Um, I'm here, but then I'm not sure about the group decision. So, I mean, okay, for temporarily, the... maybe yes. La. Okay, but the discussion in your groups going well? Uh, not really, because previously we thought the uh, topic one, it will be carried out by all. But then it is depend on the country. Oh, yeah. So we didn't go into topic two yet. Okay, thank you. Okay, so maybe um this this topic will be shared in the student group and also please um make a discussion with uh, all the group members about this topic however this topic is very flexible so we only we we only would like to try to help the the participant yes maybe i try to explain uh Ms. Indu for a while Okay, uh, the participant, uh, we have come up here, we uh, have decided to make this uh, assignment is, is uh, more flexible like that. So uh, maybe not, not uh, divided by a group, but you can, uh, what's that? Make a poster, maybe, yeah, you can make a poster about this topic. Yeah. So uh, this not about uh, discuss with your group, just make a, uh, Poster by yourself and then send to the email or e-log. Yeah, if you have enrolled to e-log like that. So I think it can be done uh, flexible, I think. Okay, maybe uh, Ms. Indun, yes, complete my, the, okay. the explanation. Okay, so we would like to um, make this um, assignment is very easy for all the participants regarding to the background of the participant. Probably some participant has a limited time, but some participant has a lot of time to do the assignment. So we offer like two, um, two designs. So uh, from those, uh, for those participants that can make an active discussion with another member of the participant, please make like the uh, PPT, the PowerPoint or the presentation for the final uh, uh, presentation day. But for those who feel that it's difficult to uh, allocate their time to make a discussion with other group members, you can make this assignment as the individual assignment. So for the individual assignment of this topic, you can uh, make some uh, simple poster uh, any information about the topic is welcome. So like um, just a simple poster that make you, um, you can share your opinion about these topics. So please choose any of the design that is uh, um, easy for you to, uh, to do. So like we offer this uh, to design because we really understand that uh, probably some is a student with a lot of time to do the assignment, but some is the workers who only uh, have a small time to um, uh, do this assignment uh, and also maybe a limited time to make a discussion. So uh, any other design is okay. As far as uh, we just would like to have your share opinion and also um, uh, uh, like a, a discussion or um, insight from uh, your point of view. So is it clear enough for uh, everyone? Okay, if uh, is there any question? 
Okay. Um, sorry, does that apply to the topic one? Uh, I mean the assignment one or assignment two or both? That, that is for assignment two. Okay. For assignment one, actually, actually, if uh, there is the representative from your country that uh, has already made some share, I think it's okay. It's not like have to be done by a big group. So probably, but I'm not sure how to coordinate with a, another member from the same country, like for Malaysia, for example, we have like several participants, more than more than five, I think, uh, Miss Desi, right? So if uh, one of you <laughs> has already made some um, information to be shared uh, from the uh, Malaysian fisheries, I think it's okay. So actually the, uh, the first uh, assignment is only we would like to have um, the share information about each country's uh, fisheries because uh, we have many um, participants from another uh, from many countries so this is the good opportunity to uh, to share the information about that okay I understand that okay thank you thank you okay I think that's all that I would like to uh, share with all I want to ask one okay. question okay 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 please uh, uh, because for the assignment one uh, it's mean that we are doing it uh, according to the country right if I'm from Malaysia, means I, I will be doing it as a group of Malaysian. Yes. Okay. And my second question is, uh, what, uh, how we want to present that the information via PowerPoint or poster? I think uh, because we will have like the uh, session for uh, after the lecture, so the PowerPoint presentation will be. Uh, Better. Easier to be to be uh apa, to be followed. Ah uh, okay, okay okay thank you. Okay, is there any question? Windun. Okay. Um uh, um uh, I want to ask about the second statement that you said that uh, the second assignment can be done individually for those who cannot allocate uh time uh, to discuss uh in the group. Yes. Because in my case, in the group seven, um, I already made the group, but until now, only me that chat in that group. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, among 17 participants, only yes. eight participants in that group, and they still not say anything about the topic. So uh, I, see, um, I see a vision that maybe all of us uh, decide to uh, to make uh, to do the work uh, uh, alone maybe <laughs> I don't think I, <laughs> if that's so uh, is it okay for 17 of us doing the the work uh, individually okay so <laughs> actually there's still no no no, no comment yes oh, okay. in my group <laughs> thank you Okay, so actually we really hope that uh, some part of the group's members still can uh, make a group discussion for the presentation because we will have like a final presentation and at that presentation, we will have the best, uh, uh, best group presentation. So that is uh, our hope, but we also understand about the circumstance of each participant. So uh, if I may ask your help, please try your best to trigger the discussion <laughs> first. Maybe you have like two or three days this weekend. So, but okay. if you have already tried your best and there is still no response, no answer, maybe Miss Desi probably can help uh, uh, make a direct message with the other participant to ask the difficulties. But if the final uh, de decision is to make it individually, I think it's uh, okay for a uh, technical reason. Yeah, there's still no other response to my chat. So there's only me, my okay. chat in that group still. <laughs> Okay, from the other. probably all of the okay. members in your groups is a busy, busy. very busy person. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Bu. Okay, I think we already... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. I have... Okay, okay. Dr. Hampono. Hi. It, uh, my name is Hampono Shaman. Uh, I'm doing this uh, summer course from Japan. Okay. 
but I'm not Japanese. Okay. Uh, Where are you from, actually? I'm from Benin, West Africa. You know Benin? Benin is uh, a French country uh, near to Nigeria, West Africa. But I'm studying in my Japan. science in Japan. So okay. after graduation, I will back my country. Okay. And uh, so according to first assignment, okay. I would like to know if it's possible to share a information a, about fishing from my country or it's mandatory to, to talk about Japan. Of course, okay. I, know, I, know, I know some information uh, because I'm studying fishing in Japan. But mm -hmm. uh, after studying, Right. After graduation, I will I will back to, to my country. So I would like to know if uh, if it's possible, I can uh, I can share information from my country. Benin. Yes. Uh, or I don't know I don't know the, the objective of this uh, uh, or what you you want to know, especially according to this assignment. But that is some proposition. I make okay, it. it's possible. I think both is very interesting. So, if you would like to share your um, the fisheries in your country in that West Africa, I think I am, I am, I don't know anything about the fisheries in that country. So, I think it's also interesting. So, uh, both of them, it's okay if you feel okay. um, uh, more comfortable with the uh, your country. It's okay. And it okay. must be very interesting, I think. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Okay, everyone. I think I already passed the time. It's already five uh, past seven minutes. I'm so sorry taking your uh, times uh, more than the um, scheduled time. So I hope that this uh, discussion today is uh, make more... Um, uh, clear for all yeah. of you so please this is uh, we really hope that the uh, session after lecture is a fun session so we have already have a serious session in the lecture uh, two hours so in this one hour after lecture let's have some fun and please remember we only have two days of a uh, course we still have a long day to go <laughs> until the last august so please make this course is um fun and enjoyable so thank you very much i'm sorry and let um uh, i hope we can see again tomorrow at uh 2 p.m in yeah. indonesian time so uh boleh langsung ditutup berarti yeah okay so today's session is already finished thank you very much see you again tomorrow bye bye thank, thank you. you thank you Winder. thank you thank you. Thank, you. thank you see you nice tomorrow to you. See you tomorrow. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.